you can out of this. We will put a lot of the stuff uh, up on SourceForge. This is probably the only slide you need to pay attention to in terms of taking pictures of stuff, but it'll be on later, so uh, we don't worry about it right now. So what's, what's the problem? Why are we here? What are we going to talk about? We're talking about basically blacklisting versus whitelisting in its essence. Uh, blacklisting is, for most intents and purposes, it doesn't protect you against complicated hacks. It's reactive. Uh, most hackers, most bad guys have the same tools that we have access to, and they can morph to basically respond to any AV signature, IPS signature, any reactive tool that we have. So th this can be done with you know, running their stuff against VirusTotal, packing their code, changing the hash, changing the, a, a small piece of the malware so it's not easily detected by a signature or a, or a list somewhere. So what's the real problem here? In most environments, users can execute anything they can download. Uh, like I said, evading signatures is, is fairly easy nowadays. There's computing power, there's all kinds of tools available to bad guys that, that'll allow them to do this. Uh, they use their own tools against us oftentimes. You'll see that uh, more, co more commonly now nowadays with uh, all the tools, the rich features that Windows offers us. Now, this is a, a typical attack. I'm sure you've seen tens of these diagrams or these, or, or these like attack vectors, but most of the reports that come out show something with like a, an attacker gaining access to an environment like this. You have the bad guy, sends you a phishing email with a dynamically generated link that hasn't existed since, you know, existed five minutes ago. Uh, the, the email domain itself has just been registered. Uh, and then the, the malware gets through your, whatever email filtering you're using, whether it's cloud-based or local, they, no one has ever heard of it. So, you know, that's gonna get through, through, your email, through your email providers and your firewalls. And then the user ends up with this fishy email, presumably from someone they think they know, and, you know, they click on a link download something. AV has never seen this, this piece of malware that they're downloading, this piece of code. And on the way out, you've got similar technologies, whether it's proxies or, or DLP technologies. You know, to them, it's 80 or 443. They have no idea if this is bad or good. And, and that's what the majority of, of the attacks, that's how they mo most of them hap end up happening. Whether it's this or a water holding attack or just a drive-by download. So we're gonna, talk, we're gonna give you a couple examples of this. Uh, this has been in the news. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's fairly sophisticated, but it's not the, the, the worst malware you'll ever hear of, CryptLocker. It, you know, I, I guess it's kind of sexy malware because it, it, once you get infected, it encrypts all your data and then it asks you for $300. So that seems to be getting a lot of coverage lately. I think the, the latest variant now can be, it can be, like, there's a worm on a USB, so you could literally infect machines by, you know, putting the stuff on a, on a USB drive. So what does it do? It installs itself in, in app data, then encrypts all your data. For anything uh, Windows Vista and, above and beyond, app data is, uh, is where all the local user stuff gets stored. Uh, if you're running XP, documents and settings, but since you know, no one's running XP anymore, right. I don't think we have to worry about that. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, no more patches in a couple months. Uh, Invest in getting the right technology. Yeah, I, okay. I, I wouldn't worry about buying XP. I mean, if you're thinking about buying XP, you know, you God bless you. But, we can solve. Uh, a lot of this stuff, I mean, you, could, you can deploy some of this stuff on XP. It just doesn't work very well. I mean, all the, all the new stuff that got rolled out into Vista 7 and Windows 8 is really, you know, Microsoft did a lot of work to help, you know, secure their desktop, and XP just doesn't have a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about. Or it has it in, like, a very light mode. So this is a targeted malware report, uh, attack that came right out of the Mandiate APT1 report. No one talks about that report anymore because, uh, you know, the NSA has taken most of the headlines. But, you know, a year ago we were concerned about China and, and all the foreign types of attacks that uh, their common crew has been executing. And this is basically the same attack I described earlier. It was an actual phishing email sent, but instead of a, an actual malicious file, it was a link to a zip file that had a, a Word document or a PDF file that was, an actually, was actually an EXE that's never been you know, submitted to any AV vendor signature-based detection. And, uh, you know, newly registered domain, the user clicks on the link, it came from someone they thought they knew. I mean, how hard is it to get on LinkedIn, Facebook, figure out who knows who, and do a little bit of social engineering. You don't even have to be that great at, at, at figuring out what executive knows what other person at another company or who they communicate with, too. All that information's really available, and we've seen our pen testers use this technique over and over against us, so. 
Uh, contents get downloaded, extracted from the user's profile, and then they're executed. So if you notice something for both of those examples, both, both malware, uh, the malicious code is being executed from the user's profile. That's something that you will see if you deal with malware uh, analysis and, and response and incident response. For the most part, they're going to drop it in app data somewhere under local roaming, somewhere there, because that's, where, that's, that's the easiest place to execute that malware from. So there's a myth. I don't know how many of you believe this, but you need admin rights to install software. That's not really true. You need admin rights to install software in program files and in the Windows directory. You also need admin rights to modify the registry. You don't need admin rights to run stuff from the local user profile. Uh, so what's the solution? If, if you know, we, we can't stop these guys from generating all, this new, all these new links and all this new code, and we, we found that the solution this solution works really well, and it's whitelisting. But, but, but accounting needs these wallpapers. I mean, we'll address accounting. There you go. So these are the arguments against whitelisting. Thanks for bringing that up. Whitelisting is expensive. We're going to talk about some of the technologies that we have that will help you with that. It will break my legacy application. It will break my new cool you know, software that I created that runs this really obsolete you know, code. And, or it will slow everything down. Or It's really hard. And it is, it is hard initially. It's, this isn't easy, but if you take your time and you do it in a very judicious, judicious manner, you end up, you know, getting a lot, a lot out of this. So, and then you, you get the arguments of, I, I, can't, I hear you can get around this. I mean, you can get around anything. We're not going to sit stand here and tell you that this is foolproof. It's not. But it'll make things really hard on your pen testers. It'll make things really hard on, on your attackers. Some arguments for whitelisting. Uh, you probably already own it, and we'll talk about AppLocker. We'll talk about some of the whitelisting technologies that your AV vendors have included in, in most of the packages that you guys buy. It, it's in there. Uh, we'll talk about how you can do some network-based, host-based network whitelisting with firewalls. Uh, it can really be implemented without disrupting your users. We've had, we've had some issues with this because we were kind of early adapters, and we've, I've had to roll back an entire policy, you know, the, the type where you get a call from your CIO and you run towards your computer because everything's down. And, and, you know, you don't need to go through that because you can, you can take this approach and, and hopefully not disrupt your users. Uh, there are a lot of ways to address the shortcomings. There are ways around a lot of the technologies that we're going to describe, but we've also dug, dug our heels in and, and kind of, you know, responded to some of the ways that you can get around this stuff, whether it's with application whitelisting or using another technology. So uh, it's cheap and effective. It really is. It doesn't cost you anything aside from time. And if you can't get all of this stuff done, don't let, the perfect, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. You know, to do what you can, get some logging, get some, some of this stuff implemented, and, it, and it'll make a big difference. The hardest part we've noticed from, from getting this whole process started is getting buy-in for management to support all this new infrastructure that you're going to deploy. I mean, that's the case with a lot of the new technologies that you're going to deploy that are, you know, that are game-changing. You're, you know, you're, we have the executive uh, director sitting and looking at, do you want to do what? Do you want to you know, you want someone to tell you every time they're going to execute a new application, or you, that sounds insane, you know. So trying to find a way to pitch this is going to be hard. And then this is the second bullet point is actually really hard, getting your IT department to buy into this. I mean, trying to take away admin rights from IT administrators or limiting their admin account scope or telling them that they need to do this or that to execute a, a program is kind of really hard. It's a tough sell. I mean, they're, sometimes they're your biggest adversary here. And then surviving the break-in period. Every new system is going to have glitches. They're going to have false positives. They're, and you know, you're going to need to really work through those and, and, and not you know, go running for the hills. And then finally, putting a process in place for approving new applications. You're going to notice that once you do something similar to this, you're going to shift from responding to malware, doing in-depth forensics, and reimaging machines to actually whitelisting stuff. So a new application's on the network, you need to whitelist it in several different places. So you're still doing work, you're just doing it in a proactive manner. You're not doing it in a reactive manner. You're not re-imaging machines. You know, you're not worried that you've leaked a database of credit cards or, or, or confidential you know, information to, to adversaries. So these are the approaches that we're going to talk about. Aaron's going to start with AppLocker. He's going to give you a lot of really good information on how we did our implementation. And we're also going to provide you with a lot of the GPOs and scripts that you can use for your environment. And then, you know, we're going to talk about defense in depth. AppLocker, at some point, could be circumvented. I mean, it's not foolproof. So have other layers that can do similar things. We're going to talk about host-based firewalls and how you can 
do this again for, for really cheap. And, and then the final piece is, is file reputation, and, and we'll touch on how you can take advantage of your AV vendor's uh, capabilities there. Sure. Absolutely. Um, our, our, my preference for bring your, the question was how do you handle users with bring their own, their own devices? Uh, I think in some ways I can actually help with the whitelisting efforts. Um, if you have your users, they can install whatever applications they want on their iPad. They don't need to install it on your corporate owned stuff. I highly recommend do not let any device that you do not have 100% control over onto your corporate network. Let it in through some sort of a proxy or some other way to access the data but that is just foolish to let something that an end user owns to have access to your sensitive data. Um, so that's, I know that's iron fisted and that's yep. not what some people want to hear, but it's what we get paid to do, security. So, um, so first we're, we're, I'm gonna talk a little bit about AppLocker. Uh, how many people have actually used AppLocker? So there's, there's not many hands, um, but th there's a couple of them. Um, and the thing is there's a lot of people that just don't know what AppLocker is or how it can be used. It's a whitelisting technology that's built into Windows. Uh, it's been in the enterprise SKUs of Windows uh, since Windows 7 and later. Um, all of the enterprise, Ultimate Enterprise, Server 2008 and Server 2012, it's actually on the server editions as well. It, this is technically version two of software restriction policies. Uh, if you happen to have a home edition of Windows, you actually still have AppLocker, but because home editions can't respect group policies, they aren't managed in the same way. There it's called parental controls. You create an administrator account, which is the parent, and then you tell the children what they're allowed to run or not run. Well, in the enterprise, we just do group policy to do the same thing. It's a default deny approach. With AppLocker, you build a set of rules that says, this is what's allowed to, to run, and if it doesn't match one of those rules, it gets blocked, period. Uh, there are some excellent guides available for deployment. Microsoft has published a deployment guide. It's about 80 pages, a great page turner. Um, and, and it shows you the absolute best practices and best way to do it. I'm gonna show you the quick and dirty way to do it. Uh, and I'll warn you, in the deployment guide that Microsoft gives, they actually tell you don't do the approach that I'm going to show you, which is leveraging default rules. There are some good reasons for that and some bad reasons. Uh, their approach is you take a machine, load it with all of your line of business apps, and that becomes your gold image. You then run a wizard against that, define everything, create rules for everything that's on that machine, import that into a group policy, and now if it doesn't match one of those rules, it doesn't run. Uh, by contrast, the default rules leverage some paths. Um, you know, the downside with their, their approach is you may have a little more maintenance when you roll out new applications or something that didn't match one of those rules. Um, and also, it, it weighs publisher rules very heavily. And I'll, I'll talk about some of those problems in a moment. Um, now, the way that I'm gonna talk about it is the default rules. And the way that this works is we're going to first make sure that our users are not running as admin. No one should ever log into a machine with administrator rights. Um, we have to find a way to enforce this, and that includes IT. Um, once that's done, we can also then start limiting users so that they can only run things that are in paths that they can not write to. So program files, Windows, for example. A standard user can't write to those locations, so we can allow those. So first we've got to deal with the admin issue. Arguments. <laughs> I've always been an admin. Well, back in the days of 2000 and XP, yeah, there was a lot that you, it was very difficult to get around the admin issue. Modern operating systems, there are easy ways to elevate privileges on demand. Let's learn them, let's use them. No one should ever be logged into their computer as an admin. You can run as admin within Windows. It gives you a nice context menu on the right click so that, for example, when you're browsing the web, that Internet Explorer instance isn't as an admin. Um, this is another argument you'll hear frequently, but I know enough to run as admin. This statement is patently false. Anyone who actually knows enough to run as an admin knows that it's a bad idea and would not do it. So. No, it's a reason to teach your IT staff. It's a, it's a re I mean, a lot of this takes teaching. Um, you need to give people the tools and help them understand the right way to do this for it to be successful. There might be a lot of relearning and several, I mean, it, it, this, isn't, this isn't easy, honestly. Um, 
Now the policy, you tell people don't log in as your admin account, policies are great, sometimes you need controls to reinforce those. So here's some ways uh, that we can do that. First, for everyone in your IT department, we're going to create a separate admin account and a standard user account. When they log into their computers, they will log in with a standard user account. They can then use that separate admin account to elevate privileges as necessary. On each of the computers, we will create a separate local admin account that will have a unique password. This is your break the glass, uh, get out of jail free. You've got an end user who's in Timbuktu with no connectivity and needs to do something administratively. You can tell them this password over the phone because it's only used on that one computer. It can't be used to own your entire organization. And then we're going to use group policy preferences to enforce this. That way, if somehow, by accident, the domain users group got added to the local administrators group, we'll obliterate that every 90 minutes. And this is what a group policy preference to do that would look like. Uh, every time it runs, it deletes all of the member users and all of the member groups out of the local administrators group, and then we repopulate it with a couple of groups. Local admin is that unique admin I just mentioned. Administrator is the built-in admin account, which should be disabled. And then we've got a domain group, which is to, uh, client local admins. These are the people that need to administer your endpoints. Notice the domain admins group is not listed here. Your domain administrator accounts should never log into anything other than a domain controller. Um, some other options for limiting admin abuse. You know, some of the people that have these admin accounts might think, well, this is hard. I'm just going to log in with my admin account all the time. We can counter that by issuing them a logon script through Active Directory with a single line, log off. Or if you have a proxy, deny those accounts access to the internet. Um, we can also use uh, whitelisting just to make it annoying to log in as an admin account. Block the Internet Explorer or any web browser, block email clients, make it so that they don't want to be logged in as an admin. It's no longer comfortable. So now that we've addressed the administrator issue, we'll start talking about applying app locker rules. There's three different rule types that you can create. Publisher, which is based on signed code. Path, uh, which is you're defining anything that's in, say, C program files, allow it to run or hash. Uh, publisher and, and path are pretty flexible. Uh, if you add new things to a path, it'll still be, that's already allowed, it gets to run. If something from the same software maker that's already signed has been created, it can run. Hash, I'm gonna get to that too. And we need to push back to our software makers, but I will, I will talk about that. Um, hash is least flexible, but it's a necessary evil. If it matches this hash, it's allowed to run. So the guidelines are, path rules are only acceptable if the path is a location standard users cannot write to. Um, everywhere else, we're going to use our hash or publisher rules. There is a little wizard that I mentioned in the GPO interface. You need to use some care when, when running that. It'll try to group rules together, especially for publisher rules. And the end result there might be, for example, allowing everything that's signed by Microsoft. You may not want to do that. <laughs> so be careful with those, those sorts of automated tools. So let's get started. Um, app locker, I keep saying default rules. When you try to create an app locker policy, when you set it to enforce, it's actually going to prompt you, do you want to create default rules? Um, yes, I would like to. And those default rules, there's three of them. Allow everything in program files, allow everything in the Windows directory, and allow admins to run everything. Um, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, this is what it looks like when you're actually in the GPO interface. At any time, you can right-click and just choose to def create default rules. Um, so that, that's available for you. Um, the actual file types that it enforces on are executables, installers, and scripts. And not by default, but you, can, you need to turn this on separately, DLLs. Now, when I say scripts, this is anything that's interpreted by the Windows scripting host. So that's going to be uh, batch, batch files, command files, Visual Basic, JavaScript, and PowerShell scripts. PowerShell scripts, not PowerShell itself. We'll get to that. This is what it looks like when you're creating a rule. This is a, an example of creating a rule based on publisher. I've taken a link executable uh, as my reference file, pointed to it, it picks out who the signer is, and now I'm going to create a rule that says, anytime you see something that is this link file, this version or higher, allow it. Pretty easy. Uh, the slider there can be slided up and down to make this more or less granular. So if you did want to allow everything by Microsoft, you can. Now, if we've done this, you know, we've done all the, what I've just said. We've limited admin use and we've implemented the default rules. Where are we? 
Well, standard users can no longer run any executable that's installed in app data or downloaded into the user profile. When they want to do something like installing software, they're going to have to trigger a call to the help desk. So we need to have some training with our help desk to say, you know, when an end user calls and says, this isn't running, can you help me? Don't just right click and choose run as admin. You know, escalate the issue. Someone needs to vet that application and say it's something we actually want. Um, but we can still administratively install software into program files or windows. We don't have to worry about our windows patches. We can push things out, no problem. As long as they're installed into the right place, we don't need a new rule to whitelist it. More importantly, attackers can no longer simply ask you to run an executable and let it go. Um, generally, they're going to be cornered in, at this point, to using some sort of exploitation. It's not quite as easy as before, it becomes more expensive. Uh, and if they do get in, they're limited to regular user account. Um, you know, when they first get post-exploitation, they're not going to have admin rights on the box. So if they want to establish persistence, because we aren't allowing files to run out of the user profile, they're going to have to escalate to drop it into a, a location that is allowed by our, our whitelisting rules. Here's what it might look like in, in, in action. Let's pretend that we are the worst admins on earth and we don't do any attachment filtering in our email. So someone in accounting receives a a message that says, here is the, thank you for your business, here's an invoice, net 30, please pay us as soon as possible, and it has a zipped attachment, they extract it to the desktop, again, we're terrible admins, we haven't changed the default to hide known file extensions for known file types, and so this is what it looks like. It looks like a PDF sitting on their, their desktop. In reality, it's an executable. Uh, when they double click on it, it installs Zeus malware or some other banking trojan that's going to steal banking credentials, drain the accounts, and suddenly payday gets ruined for everyone. And in the articles that follow this breach, you're probably going to see that sad statistic that I just cannot stand seeing, which is zero out of 47 antivirus engines were able to detect it on virus total. Here's what happens with whitelisting. They double click it, they get a pop-up that says, I'm sorry, you can't run this, please contact your administrator. We don't have to do anything other than delete that executable off their, off their machine to clean up the infection. And bonus, everyone still gets paid on payday. So rolling it out. Um, this is something, this is a, a very disruptive technology. You don't want to just say, I'm going to start whitelisting on Tuesday and put it in enforce mode and see what happens. That's a resume generating event. What you want to do is <laughs> test very thoroughly. Start with very small groups. Uh, AppLocker can be uh, pushed out in audit mode. So it's going to log that it would have blocked a file instead of actually blocking it. And you can keep going through these logs on a regular basis and whitelist and make sure that you're comfortable. You've got all your line of business apps set up and you're ready to go. AppLocker uh, GPOs are also additive, which is great. You can target specific uh, policies for an OU and it will add onto it. So if your developers need some odd program that no one else needs, just allow it on that OU and it gets added to, to the rest of, of the policies. Um, also, DLLs are really tricky to work with, so you can do them separately. Uh, you will find that there are a lot of DLLs that at runtime get copied into the app data, pro, uh, the user's profile. So start small, just do the XEs, MSIs, and scripts, and once you've got that out there, start working on your DLLs and make that a separate policy. That way, if something goes really wrong with DLLs, just unlink that policy and you're, you're back to operation. And again, check for warnings in the logs. Now, in that, that app locker, uh, deployment guide that I mentioned from Microsoft, they have a very interesting proposed solution where you're going to set up Windows event forwarding on all of your clients, forward those to a server, where you will then have a SQL database set up to bring in all of these events and run reports on it, and that sounds like a gosh darn awful lot of work to me that I just don't want to do. So instead, I recommend this big, nasty, ugly PowerShell one-liner. Um, and what this is going to do it's going to query AD for all the computers in a specific OU. For each one of those computers, we are going to test to see if the computer is currently online. If it is online, we write it out to a text file. We then parse through its events, looking for those warnings that I mentioned. Uh, the level equals three at the end of there indicates a warning in app locker logs. If you've moved to enforce mode, you can change this to say level equals two, and you can look for things that got blocked. Also note, this is where the magic happens. If you need to do some really quick and dirty IR looking for an event of interest across your entire domain, just change the uh, filter hash table and you know, seek the actual event that you want. So even if you don't want to do app locker, you know, something that you can put in your toolkit. And then finally, we're going to make it look pretty. Put it into a table, write it to that uh, warnings text 
file or whatever, move on to the next computer, repeat the process. All of these scripts will be available on SourceForge afterwards, so um, you, know, you can pick them and, and use them from there. Some other gotchas. AppLocker is only going to do enforcement on uh, regular user accounts or even admin accounts. It will not enforce system. So if you fire up PSExec on one computer, the PSExec service is going to start as system on the other computer. It's not going to stop that. You can block PSExec, but not the PSExec service. Uh, we'll cover some other ways to deal with that when, when Kyle comes back up. Also, since we're block, blocking, blocking uh, files out of the user's profile, we need to consider, um, sorry, did a Marco Rubio moment here. Uh, we need to consider um, what, proactively whitelisting those legitimate applications that will run out of app data. Uh, net meeting type things, those are a common one. You really do not want one of your executives trying to log into a conference and at the last minute to be scrambling. So go to these various sites, they all have a test your connection link. Try it, see what's being blocked, add it to your whitelist. Um, and again, since these are things that are in the user's profile, hash and publisher rules only. You also need to make sure that you're careful to add all of your scripts. Default rules won't cover like uh, your net logon folder with your logon scripts. So make sure you've added that. And Double check all the ACLs in the Windows and program files directory. You can use like access check from sys internals to do a recursive search. Make sure that users can't write to any of those locations that you've created path rules for. Now, you mentioned earlier, everyone signs their code, right? Well, it gets very difficult if you do have software that often run, runs uh, things from the app data directory if they aren't signing their code. You're gonna continually have to create hash rules. So that's annoying. And when you call your software vendor and say, I would really like it if you would sign your code because we're using AppLocker, their response is probably going to be, we don't support third-party tools. At which point you'll say, this is actually a native Windows function. This isn't a third party. Can you pretty, pretty please sign your code? They will then say, uh, what are you talking about? What isn't signed? They honestly often do not from their own content. So you may have to explicitly tell them. Once again, quick and dirty PowerShell one-liner. Uh, we're going to go through a directory, find all of the child objects of that directory, filter out directory items so that we're just looking at files. For each item in there, we check to see if it's signed. If it is signed, we add it to a list. We send this to our software maker and say, these are the exact files we need you to start signing. Thank you. Start putting pressure on your software makers to do it better. We've all got to do that. Now, by this point, you're probably thinking, there are some big holes in what he's, what he's presented. And you're right. And in fact, uh, a couple of years ago at ShmooCon, Chris Cuevas and Kurt Schaefer uh, gave a whole presentation called Raising the White Flag about ways to get around um, whitelisting techniques. Um, some of the, the common ones are native Windows tools that can be used against you. If you saw the uh, Living Off the Land presentation by Chris Campbell and Matt Graber at DerbyCon, excellent presentation, but it shows you just how dangerous some of the things that are in your own computer are. Um, macro scripting features, they aren't going to be controlled by this. If you launch Word, it's allowed by AppLocker. The macros inside of it aren't controlled by AppLocker. And of course, exploits. Um, Whitelisting does not give you a pass on regular network sanitation. We've got to patch regularly, we've got to patch quickly, and we need to stay on top of it. Um, it also can't do anything about reflective injection. If a file's never been written to disk, the, mat, the, the rules aren't going to pick that up. Uh, and most recently, there was a talk to race condition that was identified by the NCC group. It's a very interesting paper that's worth looking up and reading. Um, however, it's sort of theoretical at this point. Basically, what they were showing was when AppLocker checks a, a file, they can quickly inject a different file afterwards once it said it was okay and get that to run. The methods they did this, though, one required physical access. The other one required a proxy with full man-in-the-middle access to traffic on your network. If someone's already got full man-in-the-middle access to all of your network traffic, I don't think AppLocker's your problem at that point. <laughs> so the good news is, you know, if, if we can actually approach and deal with some of the holes in the first three, we can make reflective injection pretty darn hard for them. And, you know, the last one is still fringe at this point. I'm sure those attacks will get better, but, you know, for now, that's not at the top of our list of worries. So plugging the holes. The default rules include things like Windows. We can create exceptions to an, a, a default rule. So if it's in Windows, but it's one of these, it's not going to run. Here are some examples of things that you might want to create exceptions for. You know, in that raising the flag presentation, they said, I don't think you're going to take PowerShell away. Why not? How many of your end users know what PowerShell is and use it on a daily basis? Pretty small number. And we can create a separate group to allow those who legitimately need it to run it. Um, WMIC, Bits Admin, 
even command.exe. Um, that one's a little iffy. If you're still using batch scripts for your logon scripts, that's going to present a problem. But you know, it's been common guidance for uh, when you're deploying Citrix, for example, to lock down command.exe using NTFS permissions so that users can't get to it. You can do it on your endpoints too. Anything your users don't need to use their job need to use in order to perform their job is something that you can create an exception for. Uh, I believe the term for this is least privilege. It works. It does work. This is an example of what it looks like when you're creating some of your exception rules. Uh, you just define a path that is accepted to the path. You can do it by publisher, hash, or path rules. Um, here I've actually, you know, something that's interesting, if you were just doing path, the Windows side-by-side -side directory is a fun little place where if you didn't make that exception, there could be another copy of PowerShell that could still be run. So that's why a publisher rule accepting PowerShell might be better than path. Um, also, continuing to plug the holes. What about the things that only admins can run that uh, our red teamers and attackers like to use to beat us up? Um, you can create deny rules which will apply to admins, and this can help stop escalation of privilege. So you can block PS exec, so they can't run that PS exec service. You can block the sysinternals proc dump, so they can't dump your memory and steal your hashes quite as easily. You can block NetSH, so they can't do funny things with redirecting your traffic. Um, sdbinst.exe, if you haven't had a chance to check out Mark Baggett's talk from DerbyCon on owned by default, very interesting talk, but again, this is something you're probably not using in your enterprise, block it. Um, ieexec.exe is another one that I, I recently became aware of that can be used to remotely launch code that would be in a standard Windows location. You know, look at, the red team's given away their playbook, right? And so let's take a look at that and start blocking this proactively. Um, and you could also create deny rules for the things I just talked about on the exceptions list. Deny PowerShell. It's not, you know, try it. See, see if you can get away with it. Um, okay, continuing to plug the holes. Uh, there is a patch uh, for the hole that Didier Stevens had, had pointed out, which was launching a DLL via a macro in a Word document. Uh, it's available, deploy it. Uh, according to Microsoft's documentation, it, it is included in Windows 8, but I guess they're not going to release a second service pack for Windows 7, so yeah. Um, using group policy, you can do very much the same thing that you're doing with AppLocker uh, for Office. You can define trusted publishers for macros or trusted paths for templates that have macros to, to allow those there. Uh, and Office 2010 and 2013, Acrobat 10 and Acrobat 11, all come with something called protected reading mode. This is where when you download a document off of the internet or from an email, it opens with a big ugly gold bar at the top which says functionality has been reduced. They're disabling things like JavaScript and even printing um, by default. That lets you see, is this a legitimate document that I actually need to do something with? Um, ActiveX in Office. Uh, go ahead and disable this. If you need to know why, ask anyone at RSA about Flash in Excel files. If you're not using ActiveX controls, you don't need them. Uh, JavaScript and Acrobat can also be disabled. Unfortunately, Adobe doesn't give us very good admin templates, so if anyone knows someone in Adobe or is from Adobe, pretty please give us some. Um, but you can find the registry keys that would control this. Now, Java, Java is one of those, those really fun ones. Um, They've made some interesting strides at Oracle as far as like limiting it to only signed applets and you know that's sort of a good step in the right direction. What we really need though is to be able to say this is a list of sites that we want to allow Java to run from and no other site. Uh, the best approach that I've seen to do that was presented on Paul.com episode 350. Uh, check it out. That, that works very well. Some additional uses. We can block applications that have no legitimate business use. Uh, this will lower our attack surface. For example, we don't need Shockwave or maybe anything by Apple whatsoever. Uh, some of the other scripting languages are ways to get around it. If you watched the presentation on the Veil framework the other day, they showed creating executables that are using Pi installer. Now, by default, that executable that they would generate would be blocked by our, our standard rules. If you wanted to take it a step further, look for the files that it would temporarily drop into a temp directory. Blacklist those. If you know that you have no need for applications that were developed with Pi installer, we can, we can use this. I know it's blacklisting, but we, you know, we can use it to our advantage. Also, if you're in an IR mode and you need to quickly blacklist a malicious file that's propagating across your network, you can throw a ban hammer at it. And also, finally, we can block insecure versions of software based on publisher rules. I really like this one. Uh, you pointed at Java. The most recent version of Java that was released on Tuesday is 7.0.510.13. 
So we decrement it from 13 to 12, and we block anything that shows that version or below. Uh, this augments our patch program. So if you, you, know, you need to have some, you know, basically this is one of those disruptive things. You may want to make sure that you've patched most of your machines, but if you're really worried about a targeted attack that's only attacking an, an exploit in you know, a, a newer version of Java, we, we can shut that down using a publisher rule. So for a head start, um, I have created sample GPOs that I've uploaded to SourceForge that are going to be available for you to download. You can start using these, testing these. Um, if you wanted to throw it into your uh, native environment, you could. They're, they're implemented in audit mode only. That would be putting a lot of trust in me, though. Uh, it doesn't take that much time to spin up a VM with a domain controller and a client and start testing these around and, and get comfortable with them. I've done everything that I've, I've put examples of everything that I've just shown. Blocking vulnerable apps, blocking apps that don't, uh, that the admin could run that the attackers really like. Um, they're in separate GPOs. You can implement these uh, rather quickly and rather easily. And also the scripts are going to be up there. So no excuse. Go at it. <laughs> All right. So let's say everything Aaron talked about just fails miserably. It's a lot of stuff to fail. But let's say people can bypass that stuff. Let's say there's an exploit. There's, someone comes up with a way around App Locker. You have other ways to do this, or at least complement your, your, your app locker policy. Uh, we're going to look at network whitelisting, but from the host, host level. So next generation firewalls are really cool. Everyone will come in at you with all these new rules, all the new um, features, all the new uh, detections that they can do, but they're also very expensive. They cost a lot of money, and break-in periods often very long, and you know, it, it needs resources. Client firewalls can do a lot of the same stuff that, that network-based firewalls or next-gen firewalls can do. They can do it with pretty good accuracy. Uh, de depending on the firewall you're using from whatever AV vendor or operating system, you can create rules based on the application name, type, hash, signature, or all of the above. Uh, the great thing about host-based firewalls is that you don't have to worry about encrypting and decrypting traffic. The traffic is already on the, on the host. It's, it's decrypted. It's at rest. So IPS, the firewall, they all see that traffic. When you implement something like, a, like an expensive firewall and you want to do SSL decryption, you have to man in the middle of the attack, figure out how to distribute certs, and all that stuff. But when you're, when you're on the host, you're already there. So what are we really talking about? Egress filtering by application. And this is part of the defense in depth uh, concept that, we, you know, that everyone brings up. Uh, you want to limit, you want to mimic what, what we just talked about in AppLocker, but do it in a different layer of, of, of defenses that's protecting your, your, your hosts. So you want to take a similar approach, limit executables that run within the user profile. You can do this easily with host-based firewalls. Uh, that will stop droppers and downloaders from talking back to their command and control. I mean, if you can't talk back on 8443 or 8080 or whatever it's using outbound, you can't download the rest of the payload. You can't do anything, so you're dead in the water. Uh, CryptLocker won't actually encrypt all your data if you can't talk back to the mothership. So I'm going to give you an oversimplified rule set. If you know how to build firewall rules, this will look really familiar to you. Uh, first of all, if you have, uh, have host-based firewalls, uh, turn them on. I, I mean, people always assume that if you're part of the domain, you're on the network, you don't need host-based firewalls. And I'll, we'll show you why you need them and how you can use them to your advantage. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of vendors right now just give you the firewall license if you're your opponent, but not anymore. So, the first rule you want to do is allow outbound 80 and 443 and program files, and then allow everything out there, and then just log. Not enforcing anything, just turn on the firewall, build some basic rules, and start logging. Uh, you obviously want to have a good way of extracting the logs. Uh, a lot of the AV vendors don't really have a big enough database to hold your entire daily traffic volume from all your end hosts, so you may want to have to do it frequent enough to like pull the logs for a day and then do it at different intervals, so that way you have a pretty good idea of what, what's, running on, what's running on your network. So here's, here's enhancing your rule set. You start by allowing all traffic to all your user subnets. Figure out what your user subnets are. You can also define it by your domain. Just do at xxdomain.com. And then all traffic between your, your hosts and your servers will work. You don't really need that much traffic. I mean, who talks from host to host? Usually it's client to server communication. So if you're worried about that, you can create some rules about client-to-client traffic, subnet-to-inner-subnet traffic. 
Uh, here's, a, here's an example of PowerShell. Allow PowerShell to all local subnets, but then deny it everywhere else. So PowerShell can't talk outbound. You can use PowerShell for a lot of admin stuff, some really cool stuff that'll make your life easier as admins, but you don't really necessarily need PowerShell talking to the outside world. You can do this by hash, by the name of the application, or both. And then you allow outbound 443, 80, just to common stuff that you use. Uh, from program files in Windows, you log, and then you create another rule below all that, allow everything outbound to 8443 and log that as well. So you're still in logging mode and you're, you have specific rules that are logging specific things. Uh, annoying the red team. I mean, we've had success with this because, you know, this is something most people don't expect to have in an environment because it's, it's a pretty locked down firewall at this point. You want to allow traffic to server subnets, that's fine. Allow PowerShell to subnets, but, and then deny all these services. If you don't know what psexec or CSVC and then the other one, those are like the Unix versions of psexec because, hey, someone can get a Unix machine and launch power uh, uh, psexec against your Windows machines. That'll work. I mean, so you can block that. And then you, again, block, uh, log everything else. A final rule set looks something like this. Oversimplified, but you get the idea. You allow all traffic to local subnets, allow PowerShell and any other program you want to lock to, to talk to your other uh, to your local environment, and then you deny all the other programs outbound. And then you create a rule that says, I have a list of all these applications, GoToMeeting, Juniper, SSL, VPN, whatever applications you have that run from the local profile. You can get those from AppLocker. Or you can use this to populate your AppLocker rules. So there are going to be applications that have to run from AppDAT, from your local user profile. There's no way around that. Just, it's just the way they make some of these applications. So you put all those in a rule, and you allow everything from program files in Windows outbound on 18443, and then you drop the last rule. You switch it to enforce. Now all of a sudden, if you spend enough time looking through your logs, catching all the applications that are running from your user profile, you have a rule set that's mimicking what we did with AppLock. Uh, this took us a good eight months, and we've got, you know, we've got a small and medium-sized uh, environment. So it will take you a lot of time. It'll take you a lot of Excel spreadsheet, uh, you know, filtering, but it, you know, it, it's doable. So this is an example of a very malicious program that runs on a lot of our, and if you want to use this to, to block the downloader, it, it, it's the same idea. Java will download to your desktop. If you don't allow Java specifically from the firewall rule set, it won't work. Uh, this is another example for PowerShell. Uh, this is, I think we're referencing Chris Campbell's posts on PowerSploit. So, you know, the first line up there, you, you're seeing that you're downloading something from a local IP address on a, on a locally uh, page. But the second line is you're trying to actually pull um, some shell code from an externally uh, available website, but you see it fails because I'm not allowing PowerShell to go outside. I'm allowing it inbound. And then the last is this rule is just a ping to Google. I've, I've had a rule to allow ping outbound for troubleshooting. So if you build your rule set right and use the right order, I mean, firewalls all you know, operate in a top-down model. You can build rules to limit whatever application you want. The last thing we want to talk about is reputation-based whitelisting. And there are a lot of services that do this. You probably own a lot of them. I don't, the licensing, again, has been really AV vendors will give you everything right now. They'll give you IPS, spam filtering, AV, all that stuff. It's not, you know, it's not compartmentalized. So if you check, you could probably, you know, you probably own a lot of this stuff. A lot of these vendors use different technologies, but they essentially do the same thing. Uh, Windows 8 has file reputation. Um, it's pretty cool. It works on the OS level. Regardless of 9, you can do it in 7, but it only works for IE. Uh, when you, once you go to Windows 8, it'll actually work for any application that runs. So uh, it's got limited file support, though, uh, file support types. Uh, why it works. So most methods for by, bypassing AV depend on creating a truly unique payload, right? So reputation detection flags anything that's not known good or previously seen. So you set the bar high, you set it to log, and you have something that executes on your host that this file reputation has never seen. Uh, it's going to flag it. You don't have to block this. You can at least get an alert out of this. You can get a log to say, hey, I've, I've, there's this executable. Uh, none of my clients, and if you, if you have a service with, uh, you know, one of the bigger AV vendors, Symantec or McAfee, they have a pretty big, big customer base, and you're sharing all that data with your customers. Uh, there are some caveats to that, but, you know, that, that's another way to augment your, your network and uh, application-based whitelisting. They're very flexible base settings. You can do it based on how many times the file's been seen in a certain cloud or in a certain environment or how old it is. 
So this will really help you with a lot of stuff. It's actually caught a, a bunch of cool stuff that a bunch of pen testers have tried. Some cautions about this. Uh, there's some information disclosure. Uh, there's metadata that will be sent out, like the hash of the file, the name of the file. So you want to be careful if your organization doesn't allow that kind of stuff to go out to your AV vendor. Uh, you, want to be, you want to be aware of that. Uh, this is a problem with a lot of even the, 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 big, the big vendors that promise forensics. If a, if a malicious file is signed, they just let it through. I mean, this is a problem because they assume that it's really hard to sign malware. And, you know, it, it's not that hard. We've seen signed malware. And we've seen pen testers sign their malware to get, to get by it. So that's something that, that is a problem with file reputation and, and other places too. And there will be false positives. The first time we turned this on, it was not ready. We had to turn it off. We sent some feedback to some of our AV vendors, and they made the service a lot better. And you know, you don't have to you, have, you don't have to turn it to enforce mode. Just turn it to to log. This is just a slide that talks about the kill chain. These are, you know, the kill chain is you want to disrupt your users in, early on to stop them from, or at least get a chance at fighting these guys. And and what we've talked about today is disrupting the installation component of this chain. You know, AppLocker will stop you, won't necessarily disallow the download, but it'll stop it from executing. And then the command and control part with firewalls or network firewalls. You're, you're essentially stopping the downloader from reaching back out to the mothership or the, the command and control stuff here. All right, so in conclusion, we need to do better as uh, defenders. Um, it is frankly embarrassing that in this day and age, an attacker can simply ask us to run an executable and own our networks. Uh, that should not be the case, and it doesn't need to be the case. We all have the tools available to us. It's just a matter of taking the time to use them. I mean, let's start a movement if we need to, but let's configure all the things and show how to do it right. Um, rather than asking your CFO for, for, for more money to buy a new shiny box with blinking lights, let's ask him for far less money to get training to do it right with what we already own. Uh, Whitelisting is just one of many ways that we can paint our attackers into a corner and raise their costs. Um, if we start limiting admin rights and whitelist, you're going to narrow down the scope of who can actually attack, attack you. I mean, think how many people can generate a Metasploit payload on their own. And it narrows slightly when you say bypass AV. Uh, it narrows a little more when you say, well, let's start using exploits. But those are out-of-the-box exploits. Now, who can actually generate their own exploits? Who can actually find O'Day and reliably weaponize that exploit? Now you're down to a very narrow set of attackers with specialized skills, skills that are in demand and cost a lot. Um, you know, the idea here is if we start patching regularly, we force them to use O'Day. If we deploy Emmet and other mitigations like that, they have to use really crafty O'Day. O'Day is expensive. You read online, it can cost six figures or more. If the cost to attack us is less than what the attacker perceives to be the gain when they're going to attack us, they're going to look elsewhere. And even if you don't employ any of the technologies that we just talked about in fully enforced mode, I urge everyone to do it in audit mode. Put it out there and log everything. Instead of paying some amazing forensic analyst by the hour, an ungodly hourly sum, to figure out what happened on your network, wouldn't it be nice if you just had a running log of every application that was run and every network connection that was ever made? Um, it can be done. Um, so let's try doing it. And once again, everything will be online. I think we have like one minute for questions. Two. So one of the questions I have is that a lot of things, even like Outlook or um, Internet Explorer, things that are that remain executable in the Windows directory, put a lot of things in the temp directory and execute those. How does the work? Never one of the things that was hard to figure out when we were trying to do this is how to account for those things that ended up putting executable in the temp directory. Sure. The question was, the main executable may be in program files, but a lot of the ancillary plugins and things like that will end up running out of the user's profile. That is primarily going to be DLLs. And that's why I like doing the separate approach of just get the XE blocking in first. I mean, let's take baby steps here. Um, and then follow up with DLLs. Um, and it's hard. I don't know how to say it other than it is hard, and it takes time and a lot of testing to do it. You just hadn't mentioned it, so I right. To Absolutely. That, that, that's the approach, is just test thoroughly. Yes, sir. Uh, the administrative overhead there is we, we work closely with the rest of our IT department, train them to escalate the request, and it's a simple question. Is this needed for a legitimate business purpose or not? And, right, of course it's needed. You'll get some funny ones. Yeah. Like, 
can I install the, the IKEA? user to say, hey, I want my IKEA desktop kitchen software installed. Right. You're like, you know, that just went out to the entire IT department and your boss is going to get CC'd on this and for approval. So is, do you do really we, want this? Right. Should I ask our chief executive or our executive director if this is okay to install, you know? <laughs> Push, push back a little. You know, tell them that it's okay on their home computers. That's what they're for. Other questions? Great. Hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you have something you can use this week. <laughs>